Good morning. Lord God, it's with humility that we are before you in light of everything that you have done for us, God, because we could not do There's no pride in us for having salvation, Lord. Um, there's no pride in us for having salvation because the only thing we can boast in is you. God, we'll boast in your sacrifice. We boast in your life, Jesus, because you paid the price for us. I pray, God, that our eyes would be open to what you've really done and why you did it, God. It's important to know the why, the why, to understand how great your sacrifice was and how great our salvation is. Thank you in Jesus' name. One of the kids, as, as they were leaving, said, I want to stay in the car when we go to Silverwood. I was like, really? Oh, man, I think we missed the point on that one. <laughs> Silverwood's great. Oh, they have this, uh, this arcade in Silverwood. It reminds me of an arcade that I used to go to when I was a kid. Maybe a little bit older than, than a kid. Probably a little into my mid-20s, I think I used to go and just play video games. And my favorite, one of my favorite ones, besides the, the shooter ones, which is really probably not that great, uh, was, was a NASCAR video game. Because I love, I love NASCAR. And it was, it was fantastic. You sat down, and they had a, a steering wheel, looked just like a NASCAR steering wheel. They had pedals, they had the brake, and they had the gas. They didn't have the clutch, because it was kind of an automatic thing. But it, it was fantastic. And you know what happened is you put the quarter in, and you press go, and then when you, when you turn the, the steering wheel left, what happened? You went left. And, and when you turn the steering wheel right, what happened? No, you crashed, because it's NASCAR. You only go left. All right, you just go round and round. It's the best score in the world. I love it. <laughs> it made it easy. I was really good at it. I was really good at it. And, and the copy of the steering wheel made it feel real, right? And the brake pedal and the, and the gas pedal made it, made it feel real. But the thing about it is that I wanted so much to just go through that screen. I wanted so much to actually be a NASCAR driver. I wanted to be in there, in the game, and not be a game, have it be real. Does that make sense to you? Like, we play these things because we vicariously, or through them, live some, something different. Uh, because they're a copy of something. It was a copy of a NASCAR steering wheel that made it feel real, but it wasn't real. You see, there were barriers. There was a barrier for me to play, um, play the real game of NASCAR, to, for me to drive a real, real NASCAR. The, the first was reality. <laughs> There's a skill set that I do not have to be able to drive that, that real NASCAR. I, I'm not skilled enough. The, the second barrier is that um, I don't own a $300,000 anything, <laughs> let alone a $300,000 race car that I can go zooming around at 198 miles an hour. No. That, that's, that's the reality. There, there's some barriers to it. Frankly, I'm just not good enough to be in NASCAR. Does that make sense? I'm not good enough to, to do it. I wish I was. Uh, what I needed really was, was um, you know what I needed? I needed Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy Johnson, seven-time Cup Series champion. I needed him to give me a ride-along. In fact, I had it all played out in my mind. Here's what would happen. Jimmy Johnson would somehow find me on Facebook or YouTube, and he would call me and say, hey, I've always wanted to hang out with you. I'd be like, that's great, Jimmy. I've always wanted to hang out with you. And so we'd meet, and he would say, you know, it's been my lifelong dream to hang out with a math professor. Like, that's so weird. It's been my lifelong dream to hang out with a seven-time NASCAR Cup Series champion. And he'd be like, did we just become best friends? I'd be like, yep, boom. And then I would get to ride along with Jimmy Johnson and go to all the Cup Series races and enjoy the ride-alongs on the track because they'd invent a two-seater NASCAR. And we would go around and we would win championships together. A little bit too much? <laughs> That's what I needed. I needed a ride along. You see, the problem is, am I yelling too much? The problem is, I'll yell more then. The problem is, is that we can't drive ourselves into the presence of God. That's a problem. We need a ride along. We need a Jimmy Johnson. Well, what we need is a Jesus. We need a ride along with Jesus. But the vehicle that Jesus uses to get in the presence of God isn't a NASCAR, that would be so cool, by the way, if I die and get to sit in it. Bam! 1,000 miles an hour right then. It's going to be immediate. But what we need is a ride along with Jesus. You see, we're, we're not good enough on our own to make it into the presence of God. We're not holy enough. 
to make it into the presence of God. We need someone to give us a ride-along, a passage, so that we can enjoy everything that we want to in the presence of God. Is this making sense? The question is, why? Why did God choose death and blood to be the vehicle with which Jesus cleanses us into the presence? Have you ever asked that question? I don't know whether this is your first time. Here. There's a lot of new people. It's great to see you. I don't know where you're at. Uh, whether you understand like, why, why in the world that happened. If you're an old-time Christian, maybe you've never been taught this. Like, why is it that Christ had to die? He's God, right? Can't he just do anything like this? Yes. Why did he have to die? Why is it his blood and nothing else that cleanses us? Those are important questions, wouldn't you say? Well, even if we believe it, it's important to know the why. When I'm teaching math, it's not enough to memorize the formula. We go through, I invent the formulas with them. Why? Because you can use it better. Because you appreciate it more. Because you understand it, you accept it further into your soul because it actually makes sense when you read through this and put this cohesively together. It's an important question. So we're going to answer this. Why is it that Jesus' death and blood causes our redemption? And here's the point. The point that the only point that we need to get is that it is only Christ's blood that gains us acceptance before God, and that is it. That's the point. Let's let's read if you would uh, open to Hebrews chapter nine. Uh, last week I mentioned that uh, I wanted you to read one more chapter past our reading plan because it, it fits so well with Leviticus. Uh, I hope that you did. Have you been sticking with the reading plan? I hope so. If not, just, just go like this to make me believe this. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and read. What's going to happen is we're going to read from verses 11 to 28, so the, basically the last half of, of Hebrews chapter 9. Um, we'll go and talk about some background. There's a lot of background that we need to know in order for this to actually make sense. We'll spend most of our time in verses 11 through 14, and then we're going to read 15 through 28, and I promise you that after we go through the background and really dig into 11 to 14, uh, 15 through 28 will make a lot more sense. You guys ready for it? Okay, so let's get into it. So, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. <clears throat> for where there is a testament, there must also be the necessity, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For the testament is enforced after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there's no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year, once a year, with blood of another. He then would have to have had suffered or had to suffer 
often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of all ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart for sin, from sin for salvation. There's a lot of background for that to actually make sense. Um, did you, if you're with the, the reading plan, did you notice that the plan pairs Leviticus with Hebrews? I didn't, I didn't really, the first time I read through the plan, I didn't really notice that until I was halfway through. Like, this is awesome. Because they're so strongly tied together. But if you're not familiar with Leviticus, then all of this high priest stuff and the offerings makes absolutely no sense. So we want to talk a little bit about Leviticus and what it meant. You see, the um, Leviticus is pretty much the ordaining of the, the line of Levi. There were 12 brothers, and one of them was Levi. And to the Levites, the people from Levi, came the priesthood. They were the priests. What that meant is that they were the ones who would do the offerings to God in something called a tabernacle. A tabernacle meant dwelling place. And so in this tabernacle, there, there were two places. We'll talk more about a little bit later. But there was two places. There was the holy place, had an altar. There was the most holy place. Now these priests, these Levites, these priests would go into the holy place almost every day and offer sacrifices every single day. Wave offerings, peace offerings, goodwill offerings, sin offerings. But once a year, once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, separated by a veil. We'll talk about the veil later, too. Separated by a veil. How many times a year? One time a year. He would do that. Why did he do it? Why did he go into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, the holiest of all, one time a year? It was on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And what he would do is he would offer a very special sacrifice for himself, his sin, and the sin of the people. That's huge. Keep that in mind. But the system was flawed. Why was the system flawed? How could the system be flawed? Well, firstly, we have evidence the system's flawed because in Psalm 110, in your reading plan, David references this, My Lord said to my Lord, I'll make your enemies a foot soul, but then he swore without relenting that you will be a priest according to the, the high priest Melchizedek. The high priest and king Melchizedek. No beginning, no end, priest forever. Why would David say that? Hundreds of years after Moses instituted the law, if another priest wasn't coming. Why would he do that? Well, because it wasn't good enough what they were doing. Does that make sense to you? So, so David, hundreds of years after Moses, says there's a new priest coming, a better priest coming, a Jesus coming. He's referencing Jesus. You see, the problem was, the law made nothing perfect. The law did not forgive sin. The law showed us that we were sinners. It was a tutor saying there's a better hope to come. But it was a tutor. It did not make anything perfect. Was the law righteous? Yes. But it didn't make us righteous. Because we can't follow it. Not only that, but the priests, these, these Levites, they were priests without any sort of oath. No confirmation. Nothing, nothing guaranteeing that what they did had eternal rewards. Are you with me on that one? It was a temporary thing. There was no, there was no oath. Given they were made priests because of who they were, because of their bloodline. bloodline. And the last one, they kept dying. The darn priests kept dying. So they needed new priests all the time. What would be better? Okay, what would be better than a priest that dies all the time? One that doesn't. A perfect one that doesn't. A Melchizedek. Who in the world was Melchizedek? That's a weird name. Way back in Genesis. We read about, about Abram uh, meeting Abraham, meeting Melchizedek, and offering a tenth of all. But Melchizedek's very interesting. He's a weird character. Comes out of nowhere. King of peace, uh, prince of peace, that very, very much signifying Jesus. But he has no father, no mother, no beginning, no end. He's a high king and a priest. That's very important. Why? Why is it important? When you look at, at the Old Testament, you see very, very clearly, kings are not priests. 
Priests are not kings. Priests are Levites. Kings, even the Messiah, comes from Judah. Right? Other kings came from the lines, but Judah was in the line of kings, ultimate king, and Levites from the line of priests. Never the two shall meet. Are you with me on this? So Melchizedek's very important because he was both of them, and Abraham gives him a tenth of all. He is the high king and priest of the Lord Most High, of God. He signifies Jesus, a pre-runner of Jesus Christ. They needed a Jesus, a better priest. Are you tracking with me? That's basically chapter 7 of Hebrews. Why did they need a new covenant? Well, the old one was broken. The old covenant was broken by us, by people. Therefore, it wasn't faultless. It was no longer faultless because it was broken. They needed a new one. When something's broken, doesn't it become obsolete? They needed a new covenant. The old one was becoming obsolete. That's in, it's in Hebrews chapter 8. The old one passing away, the new one coming. Read Hebrews chapter 8. Jesus is the high priest of the new covenant. I hope I'm not going, am I going too fast for you? Are you, are you tracking? What I'm trying to build is the importance of the Levitical line and how Jesus interplays with that. How Jesus could possibly become the high priest because he wasn't a Levite. He was of the line of Judah. And we're going to see that in just a second. So, I wonder if, if you got this when you were reading through like Exodus and Leviticus. Have you noticed how incredibly specific God is? Because we talked about this in, in our church group. The question was, <laughs> why did he care about the pomegranates and the lampstand and the showbread? Why did he care very specifically about the dimensions of things? Why did he care about that? Well, he's a god of detail. He built the atom, even inside the atom. Not the first atom, but the atom, which makes up Adam and all of us. And inside the atom, there's smaller things. And inside those things, there's smaller things yet. Incredible. He's a god of detail. But when he's giving these details to Moses so that Moses can tell the people how to build the tabernacle, the place where God will dwell with them so that he can meet with them, he's very, very, very specific. Why? You probably know this if you've ever built anything that's a copy of something. You see, when, when you have someone build a copy of something, it's very specific. You say, I want this done this way. Why? I'm not inventing it right now. I'm telling you how to build something that is an image of what I really want, of where I really am. You see, these, these Levites, these earthly priests, were sacrificing in a copy of something real in heaven. The tabernacle, the temple, was a copy of something in heaven. Are you, are you getting me? It's a copy. It's a NASCAR steering wheel. It's something that they, they are in. It's important. It represents something very important, but it is not the real thing. The real thing's in heaven. These Levites, they, they serve a copy of the tabernacle. They serve a shadow of something heavenly. But Jesus, Jesus went into the true heavenly tabernacle, the one upon which God gave instructions for Moses to build. That's basically Hebrews chapter 8. i got to talk a little bit more about the tabernacle. So um, this, this tabernacle, we talked about it a little bit. But they had these two places. What, what were they called? The holy place. And then the most holy place. or the holiest of all. The holy of holies. There was a separating thing there. What, what separated them? Do you remember? A veil. A curtain. Do you know how big the curtain was? It, yeah, it was, it was like, you know, just actually just about like that, bigger. 30 feet tall, 60 feet wide, and scholars believe four inches thick. This was not today, right? This was 3,500, 3,400 years ago. Can you imagine building a curtain and carrying it? That's 60 feet wide, 30 feet tall, and 4 inches thick. My wife has blankets, she loves blankets, and some of them are thick. I'm like, this is heavy. It's not 4 inches thick, it's like this thick, and it's a heavy blanket. Can you imagine how big that is? That is what separated 
the holy place or the most holy place, the place where priests came in to the place where the high priest met with God when he descended in a cloud once a year. How did they enter those high priests? Just once a year, after considerable preparation, and only, only by a blood sacrifice. Do you remember that? In Leviticus, they could only go in if they were sprinkled with blood. Like, what? That's crazy. Why blood? Only once a year. Only by blood. Something had to die. So as we get back into Hebrews, then that's, that's basically Hebrews chapter 9 up to this point. I need you to keep three things in mind. And so symbolic of the, the way that the true ha heavenly tabernacle is to be entered. The three things in mind. The first one is this. Do you have a will? Not like, what is a will? There's a way. Like the will. Like you write it on a piece of paper. And then after... Do you know where I'm going? Do you have a will? What is a will? This is participation points, guys. What is a will? Come on. After you what? So wait a minute. When is a will valid? Is a will valid right now? Why not? You're alive. Thank God you're all alive. I'm not boring you to death. Uh, you're still alive a little bit. When is a will activated? When are the promises of a will in effect? When you... When the person who wrote the will dies. Otherwise the promises are not in effect. Are you, are you hitting me? This is what makes the prodigal son so heartbreaking. Prodigal son goes to his father and he says, this is Luke chapter 15, 11 through 32. He goes to his father and he says, Dad, I want my inheritance now. I want the promises of your will now. I wish you were dead. That's the statement. That's what that says. Wow, that's harsh. It's only in effect after the one who wrote it dies. The word covenant, the word testament is a will. That's what it means. Same thing, it means the same, same phrase as a document. The second thing I need to remember is that even the very, very first covenant that we read about with Abram before he even became Abraham, do you remember that covenant? God says to Abram, I'm going to make a promise with you. I'm going to keep this promise. Here's what I need you to do. Go get a whole bunch of animals, cut them in half, put them side by side, and now I'm going to put you in deep sleep. And he does. The fear of the Lord, the dread of the Lord falls upon him. Abram wakes up, and he sees God. Not the, not the, pres not the body of God, but God directing right through these two animals. This light. God takes both the oath and the consequences of breaking that oath upon himself. That oath was ratified through death by the blood. Even the very first covenant that we see is done that. So the second thing is that all of these, all of these oaths, these covenants, are ratified with death and blood. And the last one is this. Absolutely no one entered the Holy of Holies without blood. Absolutely no one entered the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, without blood. Now keep this in mind, that the earthly one was a copy of something real, something in heaven. Are you guys getting this? There's three things to keep in mind. Now, let's get back to 11 and 12. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. Some translations say uh, the good things that have come. With the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. Is it making more sense now? Not made with hands. That is not of this creation. Something before creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves. This creation. But with his own blood. Before this creation. He entered the most holy place. What's that? Not just the holy place. The most holy place. Not in front of the veil. Behind the veil. Having obtained, oh, sorry, uh, enter the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. 
You see, Christ died to enter the true tabernacle. You know what? They wouldn't even let him in the one on earth. Isn't that crazy? He couldn't even go in. Why? Number one, he was not an earthly high priest. Number two, he was not a Levite. One of the Levites, the line of priests. He wasn't either of those things. They wouldn't even let him in the Holy of Holies on earth. He couldn't even enter the copy. That's weird. Okay. He didn't enter the true most holy place by, by some sacrifice to a copy of a heavenly tabernacle. No, no, no. No, he entered the real one. And by paying this blood price, Who is Jesus? The image of God. God incarnate. What did Jesus do? Ultimately, what did he do? He died. Wait a minute. Who wrote the covenant? God. Get this. Only covenants are valid. The promises are only valid when someone dies. God wrote the covenant. Who is Jesus? He is God. Jesus died. What happens to the promise of the will when someone dies? They are activated. God dies. Promises activated. Not by the blood of calves into a temporary tabernacle on earth. Not the copy. The real thing. His perfect blood enters him into that. Where he satisfies the will because he died. Being God, he died. The will is activated. Are you getting it? For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, it actually worked, right? God accepted that. God accepted it that the blood of animals on the high priest would allow entrance into the most holy place. He accepted that. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, offered himself without spot, perfect to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The blood of animals, that, that was enough to cover the, the priest's flesh so that they could gain entry into the copy. Are you, are you getting me? But God is not flesh. God is, God is spirit, John 4, 24. For God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. You know, if he's not a Levite, and God hold, takes, takes very seriously entrance into the most holy place, if he's not a Levite, how in the world could Jesus do this? Firstly, because it wasn't a copy of the real thing. Secondly, because he's Melchizedek, high priest and king. Ordained. There's one more reason. If, if you think about how serious God takes entering the most holy place, all the things he's written about it, all the things they were doing, um, you can read, actually, do you remember in 2 Chronicles 26, there's this guy named Uzziah. He's a king. He's actually a pretty good guy. Like, he had everything going for him. Everything going for him. He, um, he won wars. He kind of extended Israel. He was, he was pretty good to the people, made a few mistakes. Uh, but then something happens to him. The power goes to his head. It says in 2 Chronicles 26, just read it. Power goes to his head. And he says, you know what? I'm going to go in and I'm going to offer incense to God. <coughs> was Uzziah a priest? No, he was a king. So he goes in and he goes, I'm king. I'm going to do this thing. And a lot of priests go in with him. How many times do we think in our heads, I'm not going to do it just the way God says. I know a better way. I'm going to go and do this other thing, God. It's, it's going to be to serve you. But it's not exactly how you want it to go. Is that a good choice to make? No, it's not a good choice to make. So Isaiah makes this choice. And he goes in and he offers some incense. And the priests going out, and I think there's like 80 priests. I can't remember exactly. And they say, stop it. What are you doing? I'm the high priest, not you. This is only ordained for me to go in there. And only by a blood sacrifice. Only after considerable preparation can we even do this. And you're going to offer incense. You can't even do that. You are not a priest. And he says, I am not. I will do it anyway. It's kind of a, oh, moment. And what happens? 
Leprosy starts on his forehead right then. Covers his whole body, he would eventually die from leprosy years later. God takes entrance into the most holy place very seriously. Have we established that? It's important. Uzziah was king, and he couldn't even do it. What's interesting is the leprosy. I know I'm, I, I will, we will circle back. It'll make a lot of sense, but stick with me here. I need you to remember in Leviticus 14, you read about it, how lepers are cleansed. Leviticus 14. Then the priest shall command to take him who is to be cleansed, two living and clean birds. Two, not one, two. Cedar wood, scarlet, hyssop. I don't know what those things are. I know what cedar is. Had some of that, but I don't know what hyssop is. And the priest shall command that one of the, one of the birds will be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. The real word is living water, not running water, living water. As for the bird, he shall, the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop. He will dip them and the living bird into the blood of the bird that was killed over the living water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times, complete, on him is to be cleansed from the leprosy, and shall announce, pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose in a field. Jesus was put into an earthen vessel, his body, over a spring of living water, welling up into eternal life. Jesus wasn't just a dead body. Jesus was the sacrifice. He wasn't just the king. He was the sacrifice that made it into the most holy place. By his blood, he bought it. And by the Holy Spirit, he offers himself as sacrifice to God, being high priest and king in the order of Melchizedek. Now, pair this with this. Uh, Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. This is so important. This is in Leviticus. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. The life is in the blood. It was given to you on the altar, and it is the blood that makes atonement for your, for your soul. It's the blood. It's a blood price that makes you clean. Atonement means makes you clean, pays for it. Atonement for your souls. Here's what you get. The blood of animals sprinkled on the flesh was covering enough for the high priest to enter the most holy place once a year. That was enough for the copy. But the blood of Christ, the most perfect sacrifice, sprinkled on us by him, which he gives to all who believe, is what covers us so that we may enter the presence of God. You need no, no other covering. Um, I, I said something, uh, I don't know, it was weeks ago, about a spiritual covering uh, that, that goes, goes around. And I need to let you know that it is just the blood of Christ that covers you. You need no other thing to make you holy. In fact, if you say you need another thing to make you holy, the blood of Christ is not enough. You can't get more blood of Christ to make you holy. If you say you need more blood of Christ to make you holy, then a little is not enough. Then Christ died in vain, because his blood sprinkles on the believer seven times perfectly. If another person can make you more holy, then the blood of Christ was not enough. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a, it's, it's a really slippery slope if the blood of Christ is not enough. There is no other thing to make you more holy. Every believer in here and out there is equally holy to God because we have the same blood sprinkled on us. I am not more holy than you. You are not more holy than me. We might be a little different in our maturity. We might have a different walk. But holiness, no. The blood of Christ makes us absolutely, perfectly holy before God. And there is nothing that can change that. No person can be above you to make it better. No person can take it away from you. You can't even take it away from yourself. You can refuse sanctification and walk in sin. 
You can do that. But you can't ever make yourself more holy. It's the blood of Christ that does that anyway. Are you getting me why the blood is so important? So here's, here's what I have. This is the whole rundown of, of what, it, what it all means. The promise of a will is not given until the person who wrote it dies. God wrote it. In Jesus Christ, fully man, fully God, God dies. The promises of the will are given. None enter into the Holy of Holies without what? Without blood. Okay, so, so what happens? Jesus pays the blood and enters as a mediator, a go-between for us. We believe. God gives us the Holy Spirit. He sprinkles the blood on us by Him. We are cleansed. We are free. We are redeemed. We have eternal inheritance. And we have access to God behind the veil. Isn't that exciting? That's what it means. You see, for the law of Moses, animals were substituted temporarily as a pre-image of our Savior, of Jesus Christ. It all pointed to Him. But Christ's death, we see it right here, but Christ's death pays the price of breaking the old covenant and prepays the fulfillment of the new. Um, how many years did these priests sacrifice to God? How to use that one, I'm how many years did the priest... I see, I don't have my water. <laughs> no, Lindsay, it's okay. You don't have to. <laughs> I forgot to bring it. How many years did the Levitical priests offer sacrifices to God? Years. years. At least like a year and a half. At least like one and a half times. Moses was about 1,400 years somewhere between 1,000 and 1,400 years before Jesus. For over a 1,000 years, they did the same thing. Over and 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 over. I'm not going to do it 1,000 times. Over and over and over and over. For over a 1,000 years, do the same thing. Why did they have to do it? Over and over and over again. Was it perfect? Do you, if something's perfect, do you continue to do it? Like if you've done something perfectly, do you continue to do it? If you're me, yes, because I, I, I obsess. I go, that's not perfect enough. I can do it perfectly. If something's done perfect, actually this, if something's even satisfied, do you continue to do it? I will prove to you that you don't. Um, do you have a mortgage? Have you had a mortgage? When you pay that mortgage off, the next month, do you keep paying it? Why not? It's been satisfied! You don't keep on doing something if something's satisfied. If the priests had offered perfect sacrifices, they would have stopped. But they didn't stop. They kept on going and going and going. Do you know when they stopped? Because they don't do them today. Do you know when they stopped? AD 70. Just 30 years, a little over 30 years, after Jesus died, sacrifices stopped. Do you know when they started back up again? Never. They tried in 2018. Uh, the, the, the Israel Israelis of um, Israel in Jerusalem tried to do a sacrifice, and the police stopped them. So they did it uh, symbolically. <coughs> Why in the world would God let sacrifices stop just 30 small years after Christ died? He was perfect. He was the perfect sacrifice. God doesn't need more sacrifices. There's no temporary offering for sin anymore. It's been done. Jesus paid it. There's no other temporary thing that we can do. He doesn't want something offered in the coffee. He wants something in true tabernacle, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. For his worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth through the veil by being sprinkled by the blood of Christ. That's what he's asking. That's what he's given us the opportunity to do. Now we're going we're gonna to read 
uh, verses 15 through the rest. And I promise you, I hope that my promise is accurate. It's going to make a lot more sense. I'm just going to read it. It's going to make a lot more sense. And for this reason, he, Jesus, is the mediator, the go-between, of the new covenant by means of death. That's a gratifies covenant. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. All those sacrifices in the past were an image of Christ taking the penalty upon himself. That those who are called may us may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Because only when someone dies does the promise of the will be activated. Jesus died for them. For there is a, where there is a testament, a will, there must also a necessity, it has to be done this way, be the death of the testator, the one about whom the will is written. For a testament is enforced after men are dead, since it has no power at all, while the testament, the testator, the person who wrote the will or is about, lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. All of these covenants are ratified with blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. And likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and the vessels, everything in it. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with, with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Now we know why. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens, I wasn't just making this up, see? The copies of the things in heavens should be purified with these, the blood of cows and goats and lambs. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, the ones that went on for thousands of years. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, not behind the copy, not behind the, the curtain four inches thick, but which are copies of true, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. He did for us. Not that he should offer himself often. How often did they do it? Every year. Thousands. 1,300 years. That he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place. You know what that means. Every year with the blood of another. No, no, no. Not some substitutionary blood of an animal. Mm -mm. He then would have to have had... Have, I can have to mess it up twice now. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once... At the end of all ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. By death, with his blood, he entered. Because of the will, gains eternal redemption, the promise of the world. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, being the perfect sacrifice. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Think about the veil. The veil that separated the holy place and the most holy place. When I'm showing off sometimes, when I used to, I try not to show off anymore. But it doesn't work very well, and I am sorry. It's how I ripped my bicep trying to climb a rope last summer on the 4th of July at Justin Gibbons' house, and I paid for it. I was humbled. Yes. Then I crashed my boat and ruined the ignition. It was a bad day. I'm never go to Justin's house again. Jeez, <laughs> Louise. Think about the veil. Sometimes in my younger days, when I'm showing off, I would just rip my shirt like this until I ran out of shirts. Right? Once in a while, I would get it so that I stretched it without ripping it. Oh, oh man! <laughs> Cut it real quick, and then you rip it. That's a t-shirt. Less than an eighth of an inch thick. I could barely rip it. I used to be strong. This veil was 60 feet wide and 30 feet tall and 4 inches minimum thick. Would it have been easy to rip? 
Honestly, would it have been easy to rip? I doubt if you put two diesel trucks on it, you could rip it. Four inches thick. I mean, you have toe straps, right? How thick is a toe strap? Not that thick. They can hold trucks together. That's impressive. Four inches thick. Maybe freight trains? I have no idea what could rip that these days. But back then, it was the power of God. When Jesus died, that veil was ripped from top to bottom. Four inches thick. Last, uh, last Sunday, Justin told you about how Jesus died. And through Jesus' death, he makes a pathway through death for us. Well, Jesus also tore that curtain and destroyed the separation that we have between us and God. That, in his blood, being spiritually sprinkled on us, we can have access to God. That's how the blood of Jesus makes clean. Now, what's it mean? What's it mean? Whether you're a believer or not, Sometimes we sacrifice things, sometimes in a good way, but sometimes it earn things. Stop sacrificing the wrong thing to a God who will only be appeased or satisfied with one sacrifice. And it's already been paid. It's done. You can't overpay. It's already been paid. All the blood of rams and calves and Bulls and whatever that turtle does. I don't know. Do you know what turtle dove is? I didn't know idea what that is. All that blood, as required in the law, didn't even satisfy. We had to have Jesus to make it perfect. If all that blood that was required didn't satisfy that, what do we think? With my good deeds are going to enter me into heaven. Being a good person is going to enter me into heaven. All my money. Somehow find my way to heaven because I'm going to give it to the church. And somehow, I don't know, whatever, get into heaven. How's that working out for us? And not. If people killed animals, as God said, for over a thousand years, and that wasn't good enough, do you think in the 80 years that you have that you're going to earn enough to make it into heaven? There's no way you can buy enough goodness to get to God. He will only be satisfied with one sacrifice. That's it. Um, what I've come up with is, I, I, I think you have three options. Um, the, the fact of it is not a friendly fact. It's horrifying. I hate it. But we're all going to die. Do you know that? Sorry, spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's this inevitable thing called death that haunts us sometimes. Not all the time. But it is scary. It's a scary thing. Um, it's uncertain, like the, the when when that's going to happen. But there's a certainty that you can know uh, through Christ about what's going to happen. But here, here's here's what I, I thought about. I think that there's three options. So there's there's door number one. There's door number two, and there's a brick wall. Okay. Over door number one is the Old Covenant. Over door number two is the New Covenant. Over the brick wall is Other. Under Other, you have a brick wall. It is a dead end, literally. You cannot make it out of the death of anything else besides what God says. He has given you this thing is a reason to tell you how to do it. It's a guidance manual. User's guide. There's a brick wall that you will not make it through death into life. Door number one, the old covenant. You know what it says? Door locked. Please use other door. New covenant, Jesus. That's it. That's the doorway. That's the only way. Why? Why is it the only way? Because God laid out specifically how he wanted it done, and Jesus did it. That's why it's the way. Because he was the most perfect sacrifice, and only by blood do you enter the, the presence of God. Have, you, have we established that? Then whose blood is going to make it for you? Calves and goats didn't do it. It's not perfect enough. Only Jesus' blood sprinkled on you spiritually is enough to atone your souls. That's it. That's the only thing that will actually be good enough. It might seem exclusive. 
until you realize that sometimes in life, how much more in eternal life, things have to be done a certain way. There are ways that we follow because they are the only way to do it. I'm sure you can think of lots of examples. You can't do something ten different ways and get it right. Sometimes there's only one right way to do it. Does that make sense? Jesus is the one right way. I want you to write down three verses. The first one's John 14, 6. John 14, 6. The next one is John 10, 10. The last one is Matthew 26, 28. I'll read for you. They're very short. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, and now we know why. John 10, 10. The thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life. I'm the doorway. And that they may have it more abundantly. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of of sins, it is the blood of Christ for the remission of our sins, being spiritually sprinkled on our souls, so we have access to God. We we all, um, if you believe in a heaven, you probably want to be there. The alternative is not really good. We all, if you believe in God, you probably want to be on His good side. Would you agree? If you don't. Read Revelation. Just read, just read it. Read, man, read Genesis, like chapter 7, and read Revelation. He kills everybody. You want to be on God's good side. He's loving, but he's also just. Wickedness gets punished. That's what just things do. But there's this barrier, this barrier that separates us from that, and it's, it's called reality. That we're not, we're not good at it. Actually, it says in Romans 3.23, For all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus is our ride-along. Okay? He's our ride-along from playing at life, where the end is a game over, into the abundant, real life that he offers. From a, a doomed future of death into eternal life from the Lord. Look, I don't, I don't know where you're at, um, but if you're a believer in Jesus, celebrate it. Man, live in it. Enjoy it. You have it. Celebrate that you have access to God. He paid for it. Like, it's yours. Enjoy that. There's no room for drudgery. My goodness, you've been sprinkled with holy blood. Access to God, you're clean. You can't even earn it anymore. It's done. It's done for you. Isn't that impressive? Isn't that good news? If you're a believer. Amen. If you're not. If you're not a believer. And you're pondering whether this is worth it. I want you to think about why he did it. Why would God plan so much? Work so hard? Suffer so much? For you. Because he loves you. He wants you with him in life forever. Like we want our kids to enjoy Silverwood with us. We're going to let them sit in the car. We're going to pay their way. Jesus paid you. He paid your way. He loves you. That's why he did it. It was not easy. Do you think sweating blood is easy? Do you think being so stressed out and sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, which Jesus did, is easy? Do you think it's easy withholding your power enough to be hanging on a cross and die while people mocked you is easy? That's not easy. I haven't personally done it. Hopefully, God willing, I never will. But I don't have that sort of power. Even if I did, I probably wouldn't be able to hold it. Jesus withheld his power that he could have used to free himself for us. He did it because he loves you. If you're not a believer, do you want it? Stand up if you want it. If you have it, enjoy it. Love the Lord your God with heart, mind, soul, and strength. But you have an opportunity right now. Like I said, I don't know where you're... I'm not going to guilt you into it. 
the Holy Spirit moves in our hearts. But if, if you are not a believer right now, and you have heard this, and you now understand why it is His blood, and the only blood that will satisfy God's necessity to enter into His throne room. Stand up. If you decide um, later, please come and see us. We're glad to talk, talk with you about it, pray with you about it. I know it's intimidating to stand up uh, before people, but what it says in Romans uh, 10 verse 9 is true. If you confess the Lord as Jesus as the Lord with your mouth, and you believe it in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now's your chance to do it. I don't want to cut your time short if you're still thinking about it. But if you're thinking about it, now's the time. All right, guys, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for, for moving in our lives enough to know you. God, I pray for anybody here who doesn't know you, It's not sure about it, uh, that you would move in their hearts. Lord, thank you for the truth that it is your blood that satisfies. God, it's so important to know that if we're sprinkled with blood, it's not, man, we don't have to look like a Jackson Pollock, God, that you sprinkled it enough, you were fully covered. Like we don't need more blood, God, you did all of it, and you sprinkled our souls with it so that we have, we have entry. Thank you, God, that we don't have to earn it. Thank you, God, that your promises are true. Thank you, God, that you died for us, and in doing so, you gained it, the eternal inheritance and gave it to us as a will. Thank you, Father, for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.